So hi there, I'm Diane Callahan, developmental editor and YouTuber quotidian writer. I'm here with author Jordan Riley Swan to talk about writing, specifically about returning to writing after a long hiatus. And Jordan has two books out right now. It's the Heart's Bidding is his sweet romance novel and then Limelight and Larceny in this way is the comedy mystery novel about a theater troupe trying to save their theater and I love both of these she, books and they just have she like, says it she says it's a comedy but it's accidentally funny so I <laughs> oh it's definitely a comedy but yeah okay. and then I just look look how beautiful they are together they're very complimentary it's like yellow and, and blue well we can't we can't gush enough about book fly uh, cover designs I know he's right. nailed it every single time and he doesn't even like pay us for promoting him like I'm missing <laughs> an opportunity for that <laughs> well our six viewers will be uh, uh, excited to know I'm excited to see his work to know that he makes good covers but yeah but I did want to talk to you about like um just how you handled being away from writing for so long because you said there's like a 15 year gap between sort of when you first started writing and then when you got back into it got serious again well there's actually been two gaps um one was i wanted to write even in uh, just middle school uh, high school kind of thing and i remember doing a, a cooperative story with somebody and their writing was so quantum leaps ahead of my own that i it literally shook me to the point where i didn't want to write anymore it intimidated me to that i'm like i'll never be that good so through my teenage years even though i really wanted to write i just i was I just couldn't bring myself to do it because I knew I would never be as good as this person who was in freaking high school with me or might even been just late middle school. I don't know. It was just, I, it intimidated me. And it was probably a good seven years before I finally decided to write something. And it was inspired by a, a game I was playing with some, a role-playing game I was playing with some friends. I'm like, I just want to tell the story of these guys, another event that these guys went through. So I wrote it. It is absolute garbage. It is the worst kind of D and D fan fiction crap. It, it really should have been on a fan fiction website if there was such a thing as even websites back then, which there wasn't. But it had the one thing that every novelist needs to actually, in my mind, be considered a, a novelist. The there's writers, there's authors, but to be a novelist, the words "the end" needs to be on the end of the novel and then as you have now written a book as far as you know you can go back here and spend the next less of your life revising that book but it's done it is a book so that was in my 20s but then life interfered and i had done it and was happy with it i was going to continue to do some writing at that point but my typing speed was just absolutely atrocious so it was it was just and then my long hair, I could barely read my own handwriting. So it just kind of fell by the wayside for a while. And then about, oh, about 15 years ago at this point, I was, I think I've told this story in another YouTube video that we, the one we just did actually. Uh, I wanted to write full time. So I quit my job. I saved a little tiny bit of money. I quit my job and moved back home. This I didn't put this part in the, uh, the last story. I moved back home and I was going to have my mom do the actual typing. And I was dictating into a, I was dictating into a micro cassette recorder. And then she was transcribing them. Well, I checked up on her one time and found that uh, we were having issues. So I ended up getting involved in eBay, which ended up starting my antiques career. And then that swallowed up my life for about 15 years. So I guess it was 20 years ago that this all happened. Yeah. Um, so for 15 years, I didn't do any writing whatsoever. I didn't even write a single word. And then about five years ago at this point, I just looked around at what was happening, looked at my shops, looked at my life. And I'm like, didn't I start this 15? a decade and a half ago to do writing and I'm not I've written I haven't written a single word and inspiration hit about that exact same time and I remember sitting at a restaurant um, and I had a laptop that I took with me and I because when I was at the auctions I'd want to research things so I had a little a little, little laptop and I would uh, log online and, and do my eBay research and then but I'm at a restaurant just after an auction after a morning auction having my little lunch and the first line of a novel popped in my head so I wrote the sentence and then one sentence became two two became about 20 30 minutes of sitting there writing uh with the 
waitress, the harried waitress coming to my table every so often, or, or is there, do you have everything you need? And which I should have read in my mind, like, oh, she wants me to go. I'm sitting here just, she's waiting on me at this point so she could leave, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking it's flowing. The words are flowing. It's not great writing, but it's something. And it was like a dam had broke loose. And I suddenly remember, this is, I love doing this. Why haven't I been doing this? And I realized my writing was still absolute crap, which leads into a, finally taking the craft itself serious, starting to watch videos on it, reading books on how to write and actually taking it serious as opposed to just putting words on a page and saying, I've written a book. Oh, and a later anecdote, that same restaurant a month later, as I'm now using my, the only time, my only free time I have is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I'm coming from that same auction house. So I stop at that same restaurant, order my food, and they're getting used to me being there. And I'm writing that book that's not published. It's a Trump novel. It's, and I've come to, I've, the, the ending of this book has come to me at this point and I'm writing it and it's a tragic ending. So I'm full on tears in this restaurant trying to, try to finish this book and my waitress disappears I'm like what's uh, I just I just I can't believe this is gonna happen I'm typing away and I hear a gruff voice and he's just uh are you done today sir can I can I give you the check and I'm like this isn't my waitress she had gotten so scared to come to my table Aww. she sent the bus boy to bring me my check <laughs> Needless to say, I never returned there to do my writing. I would go to McDonald's instead. Uh, I love it so much. I feel like you just need to go back there again just for real time. Uh, it just, I just see, I'll sit down and see if she's, well, we can't go to a restaurant right now. No, so. yeah. Oh, but and I know it's something too with your, with your writing, because you, you talk about how, you know, your typing speed sort of prevented you, but I know something you do now is that you record it still, right? And like have... Yeah. We, we do, I do, we've, well, um, I have to trick myself. Let's, I know, I don't know if we're going to do a video about just my writing styles in general. I'm going to make, I don't know if I you should, should reserve this. One. Okay. Well, let me just say, I have multiple things I do when I write. I do still write by typing. I do write by dictation. I do write by longhand sometimes. And I'll go into why I do those stuff in a, in a future video. But Yes, the technology is now caught up where you can record, in, and I do it one of two ways. Sometimes I'll just turn the microphone on at the keyboard and dictate it while I'm watching it and make changes as I go. And sometimes I've downloaded an app where I will, and my mom's back involved, I should mention this, I record it while I'm walking around at a park or what have you and I'm getting my daily exercise. I'll record it into an app which records my voice send it off to the internet, which will transcribe it into, they'll take that, there's all kinds of apps and websites that will take that live recording, turn it into words. Of course, it throws its punctuation wherever it wants. And it, you know, anytime you pause, it puts a period in there. So it's a jumbled mess. What I do is I send the recording and that transcription to my mom at this point, and she will listen to it and just read along and make corrections. So we're going probably a good six or seven times faster than when she used to have to do this with the micro cassette recorders back 20 years ago. Yeah, because I could never do that because like when I write, I'm just very much like a written text kind of person. So I could never dictate like a coherent sentence to, to save my life really. But yeah, I think that's interesting because I've met other writers too who also dictate right like people and they write pretty fast too and maybe that's part of it but i think it, it is yeah, it would be part of it if you did do dictation you it's going to end up being a little more commercial fiction it's real hard to get poetic when you're doing uh, uh, i mean you can get poetic with actual words dialogue and what have you and it'll even dialogue will sound even more natural when you dictate it but that literary prose that sometimes is just delicious to read would never work like uh uh was Starless Sky. Uh, Aaron Starless Morgan C. Stern, yeah. Yeah, uh, that would, it, there's no way I could see her. She has to be in the keyboard reading those sentences and, and, and reading the language as it, because it's literally, it's language. It's not a book at a certain point, some of these authors. And I can see that you have to be at a keyboard to achieve that kind of thing. Yeah. For but sure. for the, for the, okay, I was going to, I was going to make a self comment. I was going to make a self deprecating comment, but for the crap I put out, you can just listen. It can just go anyway, but it's such good stuff because you refuse to let me put out crap. That's true. I'm, 
I'm a hard, I'm a harsh <laughs> taskmaster. It's true. Yeah. Um, but but so like, where did you even figure out where to start, like to get back into? Because I find that very intimidating if I'm like away from a project for a long time and then trying to get back into it. It's like, oh God, there's so much and I've forgotten everything. Like, how do you really coach yourself into it? Um, discipline. Uh, it's discipline. What do they call button chair, I think is one of the mm -hmm. big things. Sometimes you just, and then a big part of it was it became recreation for me. It became my way of detaching myself from the angst of running the shops and employees getting paid and um, the sales tumbling down because of this or that or having a bad month. And now it's going to take me three months to recover from that bad month. Stuff like that. Um, being writing let me slip away from that. And that helped but also discipline. I think you're, the, the writers we know, the ones that we talk about are your everyday writers or that are, that are producing and forcing themselves. And it also helped that uh, when I jumped in it, I had, no, when I got back into it five years ago, I had zero intention of getting published. I was writing the novel that I wrote, the Trump novel I wrote was for friends and family only. Now, ego got away from me because I saw this novel. I thought I did a good job with it. So I ended up self-publishing it under my real name and which was an absolute mistake to do. I wasn't ready. I really wasn't. But when I was writing it, I wasn't thinking, okay, oh, the hundreds and thousands of people are going to read this. I was thinking mom's going to read it. My friend Danny's going to read it. And this girl's going to read it. And that guy's going to read it. And then that's it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It's for enjoyment. Was yeah. I wasting time doing it? No, I'm sitting there eating anyways. So if you're doing these in 30, 40 minute bites and it, you know, it's either that or you would sit and watch a YouTube video. So might yeah. as well do something productive, right? Makes sense. But, so what else helped now, you get back into When, you, when you brought up, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, when you brought up uh, getting back into old projects, <laughs> the good news for me was I had no unfinished projects. And oh. still to this day, I don't think I have any unfinished projects unless we're currently working on them. I do tend to get to the end of the project, good or bad. I do end up getting there to that the yeah. end. Well, I know you have I at least really, one idea. I don't know when you came up with it. I won't say what it is, but like your one idea that you really wanted to do, but you haven't carried it yeah, out yet. I, 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 but I have, I started writing on it though. So, okay. Question. That's the thing. Well, cause I guess for me, it's like, I have a lot of ideas. I write them down and things and like, maybe they're not fully fleshed out, but I want to do them sometime, but I might like forget the ideas I had for them, unless they're literally uh, okay. written out. So we were talking about two different things. I was talking about projects that we were that you had been but, working yeah. on, as in they were drafted, That's and you were about halfway true. through, and you you faded out. When you talk about projects that I haven't tackled, yeah, I've probably got dozens of ones that, and it'll be hard to get back. There was, and then um, I think Stephen King said, "Don't ever make notes because I, I do them, but." Well, because the better the better ideas will stick over time. The one that you, oh, this is a great idea. You write it down real quick. You come back to it later and you're like, oh, I really wouldn't have created an idea. But I, I actually do that. I do the opposite with Stephen King approach. If I have a, a, what I think is a good idea, I'll still put it down because who knows where that'll lead later when I'm reminded of it. Like, well, that really wasn't a good idea, but it inspires this. So. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the principle stands true that like if you really love an idea, like your brain doesn't let go of it. And even like five years later, you're like, oh, I had that idea five years ago. I should revisit that. But it's true. Uh, but I, still so, want to write, I still want to write my heart book, the one I, had, I uh -huh. came up with when I was 17 years old, 30 years ago. I still want to write that heart book. But I, I'm at that point where I know I don't have the uh, uh, technical skill for it. I feel a little bit like V.E. Schwab on that. She waited a long, long time to write uh, uh, the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue because she wanted to make sure her craft was there. It's the same thing. We've, you and I have talked about it a couple of times. There is a book that has zero market for it, but I want to write it. And it's going to have to, it's going to have to wait until I can look at my pros and think, okay, I'm proud. It's, I'm proud. And I think I'm there to write this one book. Okay. So next question. It's a question. Well, I just wanted to know like what inspires you to write like what gave you the inspiration to really get back into writing like when you're like if it felt daunting at all and like what sort of kept you going to to get to the point past crap to this is something readable um oh what's the what's the question yeah like what inspired you like how do you get over how do you get over the crap stage because i feel like that's hard right how like, do you get over the crap stage yeah by by you need to be 
50% egomaniac and 50% oh my god I'll never be good enough if you can find that perfect balance that egomaniac will want to see it done and prove to people you could do it but then that guy who questions every little bit of your life he's going to say no 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 you've got to make it better you've got to make it better so you let those you throw those two into a pit and you let them fight it out and you just write down what they're doing and that's how a novel gets made no, I don't know. perfect <laughs> I mean, sounds, sounds possible it sounds plausible and that's what I'm going to go. Um, that's actually a pretty deep question. Yeah, I mean, and also, I mean, like when you were talking about like uh, your other project, I'm trying not to like throw the names out there before it's ready. But like, uh, you know, you're like, I'm not ready to write it. But then, you know, it gets a bit tough, right? Because if you're like, well, I'll never be able to write certain things. I need to build up that skill in order to do trap. it yeah like how do you get there where it's like okay like i'm good enough for this but that means you might never write it right and then or yeah i don't know i don't know I don't how know. to get there no i don't I, know either okay <laughs> I, I i think at one point you're like you just it bothers you enough that it's like a, a thorn in your paw that you start a pebble in your shoe you've walked on it so much you're going to take your shoe off and go take the pebble out even if it yeah. inconveniences everything else and i think that's what's going to happen it's it'll have it'll have just been back there whispering in my ear so much i'm like i need that voice to stop a, a good example of that is the idea i had for the my uh, the, the there was one trunk novel that the the one i self-published the idea was in the back of my head after i wrote that first uh first page and real and i wrote the ending because i knew it was going to end it kept at me it kept there it kept staying at me and it was clouding my mind where I couldn't think of other things it would pop up in my oh, wouldn't this be interesting and that character should do this and the moment I finished and put the end on it it was like I was released like the it just climbed off my back and then I didn't even think about it anymore mm -hmm. now I eventually forced myself to have to revise it and work on it because that's the craft part of it but it was like being trapped in a jail cell with the, uh, somebody who just kept talking and talking and talking and then pushed them out. Now I'm still in the cell of, <laughs> I'm still in the cell, but oh, now I've got a little release from that. And once I've written a book, it doesn't, the, um, my subconscious, whatever says, okay, you don't have to think about it anymore, but until it's done, it will pop up at weird places and weird times in the shower on the drive. And I do a lot of driving for my work because auctions are all over the place. Um, it would, they would kick up. The idea would, would absolutely kick up and intrude. Now we're having to find that balance of multiple projects right now because my mind wants to lock onto something, but then the uh, other projects we're working on keep pecking at the back door saying let us in let us in i'm like i gotta get this guest is here now let mm -hmm. us finish dinner with this guest and then i will let you in and we will have a meal together yeah it makes sense it is it's like if you if you juggle everything you might not finish anything <laughs> that's pretty much it Perfect. yes yeah but so what would you tell other writers who are looking to reconnect with their writing reconnect with their writing or reconnect with the work I guess, well, how would you distinguish those? I guess just- That's my question. That's what I was gonna be Yeah, well, I mean, like, cause I guess to me, like, it's just writing isn't necessarily work depending. Cause like you said, like it's part of it, it's like you're doing it for fun and things and some people are doing it to sell. But I guess I see those are, you can't really separate them. Like writing and the work and the fun, they're all, all those things at once, but. Well, maybe you never really completely unconnect from it. Maybe it's not a matter of reconnecting. Maybe it's back there sitting there on that back burner, steaming down all your life and you just, you just have to move it to the front burner. Um, for me, it was a, 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 just a snap moment. It was a moment of why am I doing this? I tired from moving a, a whole bedroom set off some guy's second floor down to the first floor, sitting there in that restaurant. I don't know if I really did that, but I do know I was tired sitting there looking at this computer screen, looking for the next auction, doing some research and thinking, why the, am I killing myself? At this point, I was 43 or so. And my body was starting to say, you know, moving an oak bedroom set from a second floor by yourself, you're not gonna be able to do this much longer. And why were, why did you choose to do it in the first place? So that snap of, I remember now why. And then that first sentence was like a roar word to myself. And then it led to the second sentence and the fifth sentence and then the paragraph. And then I saw a book that was done. And it was all these little rewards were feeding 
that and helping me get reconnected to uh, actually writing. And it also helped that at a certain age <laughs> as a guy, you're just like, I don't care anymore. I don't care people's opinions anymore. I haven't got to the crotchety old bastard part of my life, but I'm, I'm at the front door looking at the welcome mat. So <laughs> I love it. That's and so that, that, that I don't care attitude can uh, really can really can help. However, it's always going to be tempered by that other half that we talk about that you, you crave the, the, I, I want people to like it. I want people to love it. I want people to judge on it. So it's gotta be good. I, mm-hmm. so that weird alchemical mixture of, I don't give a crap, but this is the most precious thing to me. Please don't touch and hurt it. Yes, absolutely. I love that so much. That's wonderful. So, and I'm so Thank glad, you. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm so glad, I'm glad you got back into writing so that we could do all of this. Cause if you didn't do that, then like the whole story garden publishing thing wouldn't exist at all. And well, maybe you should talk about Story Garden just a little bit. Story Garden. Oh, yeah, I'll talk about it just since this is the first time that we've really, like, gotten into it. And we'll have more videos on just, like, the general on, subject. On but Story Garden itself, Story there will Garden be more videos. But itself. at least at least plant the seed. Mm-hmm. Yes. We, oh, call yeah, this, we, have... we, we call this foreshadowing. Oh, we do. <laughs> yeah, but Story or Garden. planting and payoff. I don't know. Which one is payoff? it? Is, it, is mm-hmm. this planting and payoff or foreshadowing? Well, just be like... planting and payoff. They're like they're like the same things. Are oh, they? But what yeah. the, why do they have two names? Well, if they're the same thing, why do they have two names? Synonyms. Delicious, just like <laughs> grammar used to make. Yeah. Delicious. But, okay, yeah. so story garden. Yeah, so story garden is like our collaborative writing venture, is what I call it, because Mark is like one of our primary writers, and then we have our secondary writer who we'll have on sometime, Hero Bowen here. And uh, so we have the three of us so far, and I'm like the managing editor, so I'm just uh you know i try to look at the developmental sides of things with the plot and character and like the prose and we have like our like a copy editor we have beta readers and everything and so like the whole point of story garden is just to have like all these different just ideas and bring them to fruition and like, get them out there on our own as like a little like it's a it's a collaborative, uh, it's a collaborative. Indie publishing thing and that's what's beautiful about it i think like because uh, it's, it's not very often that you see writers like collaborate on books and publish, even though I feel like it's the way it should be because, you know, TV shows are like that, movies are like that. Hmm. So it's like, you know, we might as well, I feel like it's the, the future of storytelling, right? It makes right. it better. It makes well, everybody, it has, everybody has blind spots. We all mm-hmm. do. We have blind spots in our prose as much as we have blind spots in relationships and what have you. So if you have two, three people working on a project together really hand in hand, it the amount of you somebody will lead us through a dark area that another person would have gotten lost in and the books that are coming out have been incredible so far we'll see if it stays consistent but for now we're trying our best and it is like it's it's helping with that hiatus too i'm sure because you feel um very obligated to keep writing when you have uh you're working with other people you kind of have accountability partners right now (laughs) accountability deadline accountability is a a huge thing a traditional publisher's uh, uh, writers for traditional publishers have been aware of it for a long, long time. And then a lot of self-publishers who publish on a larger scale are aware of it because you got to set them ducks up in a row, the mm-hmm. cover artist, your copy editor, your, your beta readers. Now, somebody who's just writing a book like me three or four years ago who wrote and just published my book, I just wrote the book and then polished it a couple of times. And then I emailed somebody, can you copy edit this? And then they say, this is when I could do it. And then you release it. But if you're trying to do it for a living, you've got to treat it like a job. Mm-hmm. If you don't treat it like a job, then you yeah. will write books, but you will not uh, you will not make money writing books if because that's how you get make money is treat something like a job. Absolutely, and I and I hope that also these are books that when you look back on them like years from now that you'll still be very proud of them. You know, yes, I, I think that's something. So I should <laughs> say all my uh, every the joking and teasing and self deprivation uh, 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 aside. We are, we, not me, but we are very proud of the stuff that Story Garden produces. We won't yes. let anything out that, that we wouldn't, that I uh, often tell people when they ask about it, I'm like, I want, if we put a traditionally published major New York Times bestselling book right next to our book and you flip through both of them and you look at the grammar and you look at the storytelling and you look at the cover and you look at every little bit of it, mm-hmm. I want it to be a coin flip and whether they could guess which one was produced by a a traditional publishing house and which one was self-published through Story Garden. Yes, absolutely. That is the goal. So I, yeah, I hope we can keep it up. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's very, I mean, like any writing, every writing is, is a lot of work, but it, it yeah, is. that it's worth so, it. So like she said, that we will be going 
uh, deeper into Story Garden and, sure. and later. Yeah. And, we will, but we have to, we have to promote our books promote. somehow, promote, yeah, that's all right. Promote. <laughs> but yeah, we do have our, our paperback copies with the, like, I love, I love the continuation of the cover on Limelight and Larceny so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're in print and the ebook on Amazon and then, and Hearts Bidding has its audiobook narrated by a, the very professional XC Sands. And then we have coming soon, a full cast audiobook production that's going to be nuts and so cool um with like i don't know how many narrators but i think lot. there are 10 narrators and uh and the audience and several of them are big name narrators they're 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 not guys in their kitchen with iphones these 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 are guys are who guys and gals who's that's their living is to narrate books so you will yeah. get a beautiful experience yeah and it is it's theatrical because as you can see the theater mask the uh, curtain it is all about the community theater and antics and Running a con has the little the hat and the, the mask that you love so much, um, but yeah, so it's it's gonna be a lot of fun. So we're very excited to release all that. So and we hope to see you again in our story garden. Oh, and we've got to do it because it, it, we've done it, everyone. Shout out to our book fly <laughs> cover artist yes. who we, who's done all our covers. Exactly. So and and he gets absolutely nothing but attention. We'll see. Now you're gonna make it so that we're not gonna get our our schedule booked with him because he's gonna have all these other people. Oh yeah. Dang Forget it. I mentioned that. Forget I mentioned it. He's a horrible, horrible, Don't atrocious. We we use him every time, but we would never <laughs> never suggest him to anyone. <laughs> we should send this send this video to him. I'm straight sure he would to, appreciate straight it. To. Okay. okay. But yeah, I'll see you next time. See you next time.